Are you going to sing? People will say we're in love. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I thought it'd be good for the video. <laughs> Teddy, where's yours? Yeah. Okay. Thank you all for coming. Welcome to Santa Monica Sunset Three Six Nine Lodge. Uh, thank you for braving the traffic tonight in Santa Monica. Just to give you a little history of this lodge, um, it used to be based in Venice Beach and half in Venice and half in Santa Monica. It's now based in Santa Monica, but we're trying to bring back some of the vibe of Venice Beach. So you'll see a lot of renovations over this lodge over the next few months. And um, that we're pleasured that everybody came to this event. It was a culmination of several different groups. We actually rent to several groups in this lodge, uh, one of them being the Fraternity of Hidden Light, the Chris Harbrandt and Diane and them run. And uh, thank you guys for helping put this together. And uh, we also have Teresita Arachigaf with the uh, Grand Lodge of Women's Grand Lodge of Freemasonry here on Saturdays. So that's what all this is about. <laughs> so technically in the new Aeon of Freemasonry, we want to unite everybody and get everybody together. And we figure that, you know, many hands make light work. And we're so pleased to have Lon Milo Duquette here uh, for the first time in our lodge. So. With that, I'll pass this to Chris. Hi, my name is Chris, and I'm here to wear the Phrygian cap at <laughs> Justin's request. Uh, I just want to say uh, thank you to the brothers of Sunset Lodge 369. This is really a fantastic lodge. Uh, they really do put into practice the principles of fraternity and fellowship that we all value and work for, and it's really nice to see. So we're really grateful to you guys. Thank you so much. And I could say the same about Lon Milo Duquette, um, who also expresses that ecumenical, fraternal spirit of fellowship, which is why we both wanted to bring him up today to speak. And he's got a great sense of humor and such a nice guy, too. Um, so, Lon, thank you so much for being here tonight. We really appreciate it. My pleasure. And with no further ado, take it away. Okay. Uh, first of all, my voice isn't amplified, and uh, as you can see, I'm an old man. Uh, so if you don't mind moving, and if you're way, way back there, uh, you might want to think about getting just a little bit closer. You'll be able to see the slides better, too. Uh, actually, just do this. If you can't see my socks... <laughs> <laughs> Move to a place where you can, uh, because you'll enjoy them all night. <laughs> uh, once at my age, uh, you never know when you're just going to drop dead. <laughs> so if I drop dead early, I want you to uh, actually get the essence of my entire talk about tarot and the Kabbalistic foundations of tarot uh, in the first uh, 30 seconds. <laughs> so I know you've had a little wine. Good. <laughs> Does anybody recognize this symbol? Yeah. This is the table of contents of the tarot. Okay, those 22 petals, 22 cards, Greater Arcana. <clears throat> now we're going to go into that little white spot. <clears throat> it pops open like a popcorn kernel.
Okay. You've just slept with the tarot under your pillow. <laughs> so let me get out of this and get into the real show. Good evening. And I know there's, there's brothers and sisters and guests of brothers and sisters. My name is Lon Milo Duquette. I'm here to talk a little bit about the Kabbalistic Foundations of Tarot. Can we hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yes. Tonight's talk is based largely upon the material presented in three of my books. The Chicken Kabbalah of Rabbi Lamed Ben Clifford and the newly released volume two Son of Chicken Kabbalah <laughs> and Understanding Aleister Crowley's Thoth Terra. These three are all published by Wiser Books. And uh, you can get them on Amazon or available everywhere. I don't think I brought any of these with me tonight. So uh, please order six pack on Amazon. Uh, <laughs> Like I say, you don't have to read them. <laughs> <laughs> and over the last uh, few years, I've written a few more books that also touch on the subject of tarot and Kabbalah. So again, you can buy a six pack of these too. I'm a Mason and a 21 year member of Long Beach Lodge number 327 and Long Beach Scottish Rite Bodies. My late father, Clifford E. Duquette was also a proud Mason and a member of the Long Beach Scottish Rite. Dad loved Masonry and he encouraged me to join De Malay uh, when I was 14. I really wanted to. <laughs> I, th I thought it was kind of corny. It was like you, you dress up and, and uh, you dress up cool and everything, but it seemed pretty pretty corny to uh, to me, uh, not like it does today. But what I really liked is sitting in the Masonic Lodge room, and after convocation, when all the other boys were in the uh, social hall getting punch and cookies, I would sit in temple with uh, indirect lighting and just groove out, thinking about the mystic things that Masons do that dad wouldn't tell me about. He wouldn't even tell mom, and I really liked that. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember once sitting right there in the south and reaching up and feeling the marble top of the podium there. And I sort of pushed the marble a little bit and it swiveled. And I pushed it a little bit more and it revealed a secret compartment that had a little blue book filled with squiggly symbols and stuff. And I went, wow. <laughs> Sorry, I, I digress there. <laughs> Sadly, uh, Dad died before I had a, uh, before he had a chance to see me raised or receive my cap. Dad was perhaps the most honest and noble person I've ever known. He wasn't a religious person per se. As a matter of fact, he said, when I asked him if he was an atheist, he said, no, I can't be. I'm a Mason. But he was defined by an almost mystical standard of moral integrity. He was a good man, but he was good for goodness sake, and not because of any particular religious doctrine or belief. Rather, he was good because he knew in his heart being good was the natural way to be. 
He lived his life as if he actually understood that a fund of science and industry is implanted in man for the best, most salutary and beneficent purposes. He loved being a Mason, and he told me that the craft was the cornerstone of his character. Like many Masons in the 40s and 50s, he had a small collection of Masonic books that I rarely saw him read. But they always fascinated me when I was a kid, and the book that attracted me the most was Morals and Dogma by Al Albert Pike. It was a big, beautiful tome with beautiful golden uh, double-headed eagle stamped on the corner. And inside, it was peppered with strange images and symbols and mystical-looking illustrations. Now, many of you probably have a copy of Morals and Dogma. It was a pretty hard read for a kid. It's a pretty hard read for a 71-year-old man. But I was fascinated, fascinated by all the references to ancient mystery schools and gods and goddesses mysterious religions and philosophies of ancient civilizations and cultures. I had no idea how all these exotic subjects could possibly have anything to do with dad's corny Mason friends. But it was pretty clear to me that this guy, Albert Pike, wasn't corny. And he thought this mystical stuff was very important to masonry. It was in Morals and Dogma that I first came across references to Kabbalah and tarot. Now, I'll digress for just a minute. Uh, Kabbalah is spelled, you've probably seen it spelled all sorts of ways. Uh, Kabbalah with a Q, Kabbalah with a K and two Bs. Kabbalah with the C, and you can find it Q U. You can find it uh, Kabbalah with a B, with a single B, and with no H at the end. Basically, it's like this: Kabbalah with a Q. When you see it most often today, is usually referred to the the type of Kabbalah or Kabbalistic thought and exercises performed by hermeticists, Western mystics, ceremonial magicians. Kabbalah with a K and two Bs is the traditional way that uh, German and European Orthodox Jewish Kabbalists that incorporate the Kabbalah as part of their religion would spell it. And Kabbalah with a C was made popular during the Renaissance by Christian mystics that didn't want to be confused with either one. But Kabbalah is really spelled with only three letters, the Hebrew equivalent to Q, B, and L. Kuf, Bet, and Lamed. Okay, back to morals and dogma. There are lots of references to Kabbalah. In fact, if you're lucky enough to own an older edition of Morals and Dogma that includes a 208-page digest index at the end, you'll find two full pages just in the index containing 65 references to Kabbalah and Kabbalistic subjects. Listen to a couple of these. Kabbalah gives to masonry secrets and symbols. Kabbalah, an entire, perfect, unique theology in the secret traditions. Kabbalah consecrates the alliance of the universal reason and divine word. Kabbalah contains a doctrine logical, simple, absolute. And my favorite, 
He who desires to attain understanding of the great word and the possession of the great secret ought carefully to read the hermetic philosophers and must take for the key of their allegories the single dogma of Hermes contained in his emerald tablet and follow the order indicated in the Kabbalistic alphabet of tarot. Now, the Kabbalistic alphabet Pike was referring to is the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, which the Hermetic and Masonic Kabbalists in Pike's day secretly attributed to the 22 cards of the greater arcana of tarot. Obviously, Pike believed that to understand the grand word and the great secret of masonry, we probably should seek to understand this single dogma of the Emerald Tablet of Hermes, which most of us have uh, learned is summed up in the phrase, as above, so below. And Pike goes on to tell us we should also be familiar with and meditate on the order of the Kabbalistic alphabet of tarot. Now, Kabbalah isn't a religion. It's not a belief system, but it's a process of systematically waking up to higher and higher levels of self-realization. In a way, Kabbalistic thought serves to trick our everyday consciousness into expanding. It does this by reorganizing our perception of absolutely everything we observe and every thought we think. Of expanding our consciousness to more clearly reflect that of the Supreme Grand Master of the cosmos. As above, so below. So let's take Brother Pike's advice and briefly follow the order indicated by the Kabbalistic alphabet of tarot and see where it leads us. Let's start by looking at the oldest and most fundamental source book of Kabbalah, the Sefer Yetzirah, or the Book of Creation, or probably more accurately, the Book of Formation. Nobody really knows who originally wrote it or exactly when, but it's very old and predates all other works of its kind. It starts right off by telling us, Yah, the Lord of hosts, formed and created the universe in 32 mysterious paths of wisdom. These 32 paths consist of a decade out of nothing and 22 fundamental letters. Now, Kabbalists see number one as the light of pure consciousness, the pure consciousness of the singularity. The following numbers are a descent into deeper and deeper levels of darkness and illusion. Number one is infinite awakeness. And the rest of the numbers are progressively grosser levels of sleep and dream. Kabbalists attempt to illustrate this with a diagram known as the Tree of Life. The decade out of nothing is described as ten fundamental emanations from which Godhead, or number one, somehow emanated out of a pre-existent nothingness. Number one is the primal singularity like the Big Bang singularity before it banged. It's the absolute supreme consciousness. And for some reason that even Kabbalists don't even try to explain, it desired to be self-aware.
Seeking to know itself, it reflects inwardly to get a good look at itself. And in doing so, creates number two, which really isn't real, but only the reflection of number one. But it's too late, it doesn't stop there. When two was created, it instantly created a third condition, the knowledge of the difference between one and its reflection, the knowledge that there's a difference between the self and the not-self. It's a third condition. This trinity isn't really three separate numbers. Two and three are just aspects of one thinking about itself. This is the Holy Trinity of your choice. This is why so many religions and philosophies try to view or explain or describe the singularity as a trinity of some kind. And in just the same way that one reflected itself to create two, this trinity unit reflected and created the second trinity unit. And just like three instantly came when two was created, a third trinity unit was formed. Concrete material existence finally manifests with the number 10 that sort of hangs like a afterthought or a dingleberry at the very end. <laughs> That's a Kabbalistic term. <laughs> it dangles like a gross and heavy pendant from the three triads of abstractions of levels of consciousness above it. So that's the decade out of nothing. I have about four very vulgar ways of retelling that story. This, <laughs> Believe me, you got the most sanitized version. <laughs> now, joining these 10 emanations are 22 paths. These are the fundamental letters of the Hebrew alphabet, and they connect the 10 sephiroth, and they serve like electrical transformers that step up or step down, or more accurately, step up and step down, the consciousness frequencies between the sephira, sephiroth that they connect. Remember your model train set? Maybe you don't. <laughs> Back in the 1890s, I... <laughs> you couldn't plug your electric train right into the wall or it would fry and set the Christmas tree on fire. <laughs> you needed a transformer that toned down the electricity, toned down the frequency. But when you wanted it to go fast, you could tone it back up again. Each of these paths is toning down the frequency going from, say, number five here to number eight here. But it's toning up the frequency from number eight going back up to number five. And it's happening simultaneously. Like electricity and it's grounding. It's happening simultaneously. Sefer Yetzira has uh, identifying markers or identifying names for every one of these consciousness paths. And we won't get into that tonight because you've just had too much wine. <laughs> no, the more wine the better, I think. This is how you usually see a tree of life in Hermetic uh, uh, Kabbalah. We've got uh, planetary spheres from Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sun, 
uh, Venus, Mercury, and Luna, and Dinkleberry. <laughs> Now, when we view things with our everyday consciousness from down here in number 10, this may look like creation. But from the point of view of Godhead, from the point of view of number one, it's a series of real downers. Like being drugged and falling into deep, a deeper series of deeper and deeper hallucinatory dreams. Number one is the ultimate and only wake-up reality. Number two and three and all the other numbers in our Tree of Life diagram represent the ultimate Russian doll of consciousness. Have you ever had uh, found yourself in a, in a dream, and it might be an uncomfortable dream, and uh, it's just weird, crazy, uncomfortable dream, and all of a sudden, in your dream, you go, okay, this is too much, I'm out of here. <laughs> and th then you wiggle a toe, or you move your elbow, and instantly, you wake up and you're out of that dream. And the whole reality that you were so invested in just a moment before just fades away. As the seconds pass, you can't even remember what they were like because you're in a new level of consciousness. When a disciple asks the Buddha, how do I get where, you're, where, where you've gone, where you are? And he said, I didn't go anywhere. I just woke up. That's exactly what moving from one sephira to another is. You just wake up. This Russian doll of consciousness, this dreams, <laughs> within dreams, within dreams, within dreams of the Godhead, until finally at number 10, we come to your sleepy little head. <laughs> As above, so below. <laughs> Kabbalistic studies, exercises, and meditations help us identify, dissect, and understand each of these levels of the Supreme Consciousness so that we may systematically awaken from each Russian doll of the great dream. The first thing we need to know about the Hebrew alphabet is that like the Greek and other ancient alphabets, each of the letters is also a number. Hebrew words, therefore, have an abstract numerical property and each share underlying mathematical harmonies and relationships. And they share them with all other words and numbers. Each letter also has its own meaning and its own story. For example, and I know this will be a tired old example for many of you, the first word of the Old Testament in Genesis, is Bereshit. And please excuse my Hebrew pronunciation. My rabbi, Rabbi Lamed Ben Clifford, <laughs> taught me there is no correct Hebrew pronunciation. So, and of course, in Hermetic Kabbalah, it doesn't matter how you pronounce it. I, keep trying to tell people. <laughs> Bereshit. Uh, if we just read the word as if it was a word in a narrative, 
in a story, it roughly translates to the phrase, in beginning. It's not even in the beginning. It's in beginning. And if you really wanted to say in beginning or in the beginning, you would not say Bereshit. It's a unique word of its own that has just been translated in the beginning. But to a Kabbalist examining each letter of the word, it reveals a more interesting story. Looking at each letter and its Kabbalistic significance, Bereshit says something like, container of existence, breath of radiant light sealed in a container. That sounds to me more like an attempt to describe the atomic structure of matter and energy. An atom is a container of existence. An electron is a container of existence. Now that's a truly poetic description of the beginning of the manifest universe. Kabbalists strive to connect everything in the universe with everything else in the universe by viewing every thought, every concept, every object as the reflection of every other object, thought, and concept. Meditating until the infinite unity of all existence becomes profoundly self-evident. The Kabbalist consciousness is finally realized as the perfect reflection of the divine and supreme consciousness. Okay, hold on. Take a breath. If you brought your wine in, take another slug. This part's actually simple. The Sefer Yetzira tells us that the 22 letters evolved in three stages as pure God consciousness fell into a deeper and deeper sleep of manifest creation. First, the three mother letters popped out of a primal singularity, just like the Big Bang. Then from the three mothers developed the seven double letters. They're called double letters because they represent a descent into consciousness into the concept of duality. Before that, there was no duality. Duality is a downer. The interaction of the double letters with each other creates 12 simple letters which gauge, engage in a perpetual battle with all the co uh, chaotic forces of nature. This battle is pretty much what we believe to be waking consciousness and objective reality. What's fundamentally important to us right now are the sacred numbers themselves, 3, 7, and 12. The universe as we know and the objective reality we perceive around us was created by 3, 7, and 12. Three mother letters actually create space-time. And here's how. You've already seen it. It's already in you. You saw it at first. Start by pretending you are the pre-Big Bang, pre-existence, supreme being to be. For some reason, you desire to be self-aware. A desire to create a cosmos out of yourself. An environment for existence to exist. But as yet, you have no elbow room to do all that. So you have to start somewhere. So you contract your weird nothingness into a point and formulate yourself as a dimensionless and positionless center of nowhere. Then you start to stretch yourself. And in doing so, you create infinitely extending upwardness and you seal the above to keep it extending forever. 
Then from your center you stretch again, only now infinitely downward, and you create and seal the infinite below. From a point to a line. That's a start, but it's a pretty slender universe. So from your formless primal center, you stretch and seal infinite extending eastness, and then stretch again to create infinite westness. From a line to a superface. <laughs> Then from your center, you stretch again, only now in front of you. You create and seal the infinite north. Then you stretch again in back of you and create infinite southness. And in doing so, you've created dimensional space. From a superface to a... <laughs> Very good. You've qualified. <laughs> from a superface to a solid. These three lines, the lines that are the up, down, right, left, forward, back of space itself are the three mother letters, Aleph, Mem, and Sheen. They're assigned to the tarot trumps, the fool, the hanged man, and judgment, which also represent three primal elements, air, water, and fire. Now, you may ask where Earth is here. Well, Earth is a very wonderful and special element that has something directly to do with the fifth element spirit. But it's really weird and strange, and it's a whole class of, of its own, and you'll have to invite me back to talk about that. Otherwise, I mean, we'll have to, yeah, some other time. Well, it's pretty obvious that up, down, right, left, and forward, backwards creates dimensional space. But the three mother letters create something else at the same time because relative motion within space creates time. That's pretty big work for just three letters. Now let's quickly move on to the seven double letters which developed or devolved from the innocence of the three mother letters. I say devolve because before the three mother letters created up, down, right, left, and forward, and backwards, there was no such thing as opposites. No concept of duality to spoil the divine oneness of Godhead. Kabbalists try to understand this fall from purity like this, and they reach back into Greek mythology. Before there were the gods of Olympus, there were titans who ruled a chaotic pre-existence. Chief among the titans was Saturn, the titan that ate his own babies. As long as he was eating his own babies, the universe remained in potentiality. Once one of those babies escaped, blammo, manifest creation began and the gods of Olympus came with it to run the whole show. The Kabbalists imagine the primal focus singularity, this inscrutable source, as the most distant and mysterious planetary sphere of Saturn and the Hebrew letter Tav. When Aleph burst out of the central point, two double letters were created. Beth for above and Gimel for below. Beth is the planetary sphere of Mercury, and Gimel, the planetary sphere of the moon. 
When Mem burst out, two more double letters were created, Daleth for the east and Kaf for the west. Daleth is the planetary sphere of Venus and Kaf the planetary sphere of Jupiter. When Sheen burst out, two more double letters were created, Pei for the north and Resh for the south. In the alphabet of tarot, the seven double letters are assigned to the magician, the high priestess, the empress, the wheel of fortune, the tower, the sun, and the universe card. It's the inscrutable Saturn, Tav. And if you're familiar with the, the image on the universe card, it's a dancer or a goddess inside is a zero. There's two zeros in the tarot. The fool zero, because it's key number zero. He is potentiality becoming, jumping out of potential and into manifestation. And Saturn at the very end, the universe, is a whole manifest cosmos being withdrawn back into pre-existence. Saturn's a pretty cool. And when you're hit about 60 years old and have seen Saturn come back in your chart twice, he starts to be a pretty cool guy. <laughs> the dualities created by the seven double letters are life and death, Peace and war, wisdom and folly, wealth and poverty, beauty and ugliness, fruitfulness and sterility, and dominion and slavery. Finally, we come to the 12 simple letters. And the final phase of the descent of divine consciousness into manifest creation. Three mother letters form space and time and the concept of the three primitive elements. The seven double letters brought us the illusion of dualities and the seven unique specific characteristics of the seven planetary spheres. The cube of space-time that the letters have created has 12 edges. And each of these edges has been created by a muddy gumbo of the elemental and planetary forces that gave it existence. The 12 simple letters have made Godhead fall into a chaotic and restless slumber, dreaming the lowest and most illusionary dream. But unfortunately, it's the dream that we think is reality. The dream in which life and existence itself is eternal conflict. an eternal war. And I'm not just making this up. This is in the Sefer Yetzirah, okay? It's the job of the 12 simple letters to beat the crap out of each other. That's, I quoted. <laughs> an eternal war of concepts, qualities, and forces. As in all wars, there is ultimately no reasonable motive for the conflict. The combatants have forgotten their pure divine origins and have fallen so deeply asleep, they've poisoned the cast of characters that populate their dreams. They self-identify only as pieces of pieces of pieces of the one and indivisible. They war like tormented children, blindly discharging the elemental and planetary fragments that blindly animate them. In their fevered dreams of separation, they fight never-ending battles to plant flags of vain victory 
upon hilltops of ever-shifting sand. The combative nature of the twelve simple letters is reflected in the heavens as the belt of the zodiac. It's the field of battle where the myriad forces of elements, planets, powers, and principalities all attract and repel each other, forming and disillusion, dissolving perpetual, ever-changing alliances, hostilities, truces, marriage, and betrayals. This is Game of Thrones. The tarot cards representing the 12 simple letters and the signs of the zodiac are the emperor, the hierophant, the lovers, the chariot, strength, the hermit, justice, death, temperance, the devil, the star, and the moon. And they all have their places on the edges of the queue. These 22 cards are called the greater arcana. And in divination, they represent great karmic forces in our lives. Does anybody here read tarot cards? OK. A constellation of cards or a, or a spread of cards that are predominantly uh, trump cards or greater arcana cards are so destiny-oriented, so connected to great karmic events and movements that if the, if the client gets all trumps, no matter what the question was, you say, relax. There's nothing you can do to make it better or nothing you can do to screw it up. Okay. It's, it's like everybody on the Titanic. They had all trumps that night. Okay. It's the lesser arcana that really reflect what the little things that you can do or cannot do to change the uh, conditions of the, of the question. The 20, oh, excuse me, the 56 small cards of the Lesser Arcana. They represent more in your face aspects of life. And for the most part, it's the Lesser Arcana Brother Pike was referring to when he mentioned the grand word and the great secret. Jehovah is spelled in Hebrew yod He vav He. Kabbalists organize all creation under the rulership of one or more of these letters. They attempt to wrap their meat brains around the inscrutable totality of existence and being as if it were divided into four Kabbalistic worlds. Atzalith, the archetypal world. Bria, it's probably Bria, but I love to say Bria, the world of soft cheeses. <laughs> Bria, the creative world. Yet Zyra, the formative world and Asiya, the material world. The, we can go into all sorts of things by why Jehovah is uh, represented with a, as a four-letter word. Uh, but Jehovah is four. He's the God four. Number four on the tree of life is the fourth is the first sephira beneath the abyss. The first sephira that escaped one, two, and three. So in the in uh, in Greek mythology, does anybody remember who the god was that escaped being eaten? It was Zeus. Baby Zeus, his mother says, I'm sick of you eating all the babies. <laughs> and she wrapped up a, a stone in, uh, 
uh, a diaper <laughs> and fed it to, to uh, Saturn. And then she stole little baby Zeus and took him below the abyss and created four, created an ordered universe. And in your face, oh, this is a universe universe. <laughs> And he became the god four. Now, Zeus looked around. He was sort of like a tetrahedron, you know, uh, a pyramid that just has, has three sides, OK? It has a pyramid, uh, triangular base. That's Sephira one, two, and three. And number four is the tip of the tetrahedron. Can we all picture that? Okay, the tip of the tetrahedron, number four, looks around and says, I must be God. I don't see anybody else up here. It's a God that thinks it's God, but it's not God. It's a God that thinks it's number one, but actually it's a number four. Can you follow that? The Greeks have a word for a God that thinks it's God, but it isn't God because it didn't know there were three qualities that went into creating it. The God that thinks it's God, but ain't God, is called a demiurgos. And the demiurgos, they would call Jove, Jupiter, Jove. And when you've had a little wine, You pronounce it Jove. <laughs> well, maybe it didn't happen just like that, but you did. It happened pretty much like that. Because Jehovah is another way to say Jove. And Jehovah, much as he did big things in the Bible, is still the God that thinks he's God, but it ain't God because he's a manifest God. He's a jealous God because he's up here in the point. <laughs> Ain't nobody but me, okay? So, Jehovah is spelled in Hebrew. Oh, okay, so, that's why we've got four Kabbalistic worlds. Each world associated with one of the, the Hebrew letters. The chairs that you're sitting on are right here in S. <laughs> I'm a vulgar man. <laughs> the chairs you're sitting on are in Asia. OK. Thomas Edison supposedly created everything, invented everything in the 20th century which is, of course, not true. But he did invent a lot of things, and he did it this way. He would get an idea, a real big, big idea of some kind. Well, hold that thought for a second. Let me go on with this for a second. You're, the chair you're sitting on is in Asia. We can see it. It has things in common with all the other chairs. Okay, when we hit our head on our, our heads in Asia, our chairs in Asia, the pain's in Asia. But each of these chairs had a blueprint, which was an idea, and that idea was non-material. It was in another world. It was in a formative world. It was an idea for each one of these chairs. Not only that, but above the idea of this particular chair that you were in was the idea of all objects that get people off their feet. The big concept of ass resting. <laughs> and that was right up here 
in Bria, or Bria, the world of soft cheeses. Notice there's tarot suits that are associated with each of these. Then above that is the idea of just rest, the most generic aspect of rest. That generic aspect of rest becomes created to a specific kind of rest. People rest, which comes down to actual formation in the mind of specific chairs, which actually manifest as a, as a chair. It actually took a uh, workman, probably in China, <laughs> to th put the chairs together that we're sitting on. We could, in the, the allegory of uh, magic, we could call them angel, worker angels. Uh, uh, in your face, uh, demons even. But happy demons with a job. <laughs> and then the guys that create the blueprints that, that first see that chair in their minds, we would call them angels. Okay? And their boss that actually said, yeah, people got to get off their seat. Oh, you angels, come here. Listen to this. People will die if they don't get off their feet. <laughs> That's up there in Briah. He's an archangel. And the aspect of God, the singularity itself, that's responsible for the generic concept of rest is God up there in Adzilith, the archetypal world. Does that make sense? And the Kab this is why Kabbalists, uh, especially in the Middle Ages, were magicians. They were working with a reality behind a reality behind a reality. And they were personifying the forces in each one of these realities as spirits that are ruled by angels, who are ruled by archangels, who are ruled by a uh, particular facet of deity. We could look at the four forces of nature, uh, starting with gravity. Gravity is a great archangel. And he's got angels working for him. The, the, the archangel Gravity AL. I'm Gravity AL, great <laughs> archangel. But he's got Drop AL working for him. <laughs> And he's got slide AL, and he's got drip AL, and he's got plummet AL and splat AL, all working for it as angels. Does that make sense? Okay, that's. We have these four worlds reflected in us. The Kabbalists say we're made in the image of deity. So we're walking around. We're a four part Kabbalistic world walking around. And they call that the four parts of our soul. The life force itself, the top, Neshima, the soul intuition, Ruach, our intellect, and ne Nepish, our physical body. And it includes all the even non-material things, uh, nerves and forces within ourselves. So, we're all sitting here in our Nepishes. How's your nepish today? Oh, I got a pain in my nepish. <laughs> but the ruach, the ruach, just one step a step up, is when we actually know where everyone is going to sit at Thanksgiving dinner, and we're going to know what the kitchen smells like, and we're going to. That's where we make our plans. We formulate our, our non-material plans. When gra I mean, Grandma 
in her ruach knows where everybody's nepish is going to be on Thanksgiving. <laughs> and right above that is our neshama. Now, we may be sitting in our nepishes, squirming by now. I'm almost through. But we're all sitting inside each other's neshama. We are just like chunks of pineapple in a giant neshama bowl of jello. You've heard the story when a mother wakes up in the middle of the night and she knows her child has been in an accident or some traumatic event. Okay, It's not even psychic phenomena. You can't even get your article published in Fate magazine. It's so, it's so common. And it's not because the, the child telegraphed some message to mom. Mom, I'm in trouble. I shouldn't have tried to sell. <laughs> Yeah. I, yeah, I knew he was baking soda, but I thought he was. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't send a message, not even at the, at the speed of light. He didn't send a message and she picked it up. He could have been on the other side of the moon and she would have got it just like that. I can't prove this, but we all know it's true. He could have been on Alpha Centauri, what, eight light years away? She, he would have got that message just like that. He could have been 50 million light years away, and she would have got it just like that. And it's not because he sent a message and she received it. It's because there's no place in the cosmos that that child could go that would ever get out of his mother's neshama. Isn't that depressing? <laughs> so we're all in each other's neshama. It's called the soul intuition. And it's bigger than the ruach. I mean, our physical bodies can die, and there's some ruach left. But then when the ruach dissolves, or an Egyptian crocodile eats it, then the nepish is still there. And above the nepish is the chai, You've heard the toast to life, lechaim. That's the root of that word, chai, the life force itself. Each, each one of those Kabbalistic worlds and each one of those parts of the soul are a suit of tarot cards. Wands, cups, swords, and discs. OK. Well, so much for my ad lib. <laughs> the four aces of the lesser arcana represent these four Hebrew letters in their purest form. Yod, the ace of wands in the element of fire. He, the ace of cups in the element of water. Vav, the ace of swords in the element air. And the final He, the ace of discs in the element of earth. You notice... That earth, this special earth, doesn't even get its own Hebrew letter. <laughs> oh, just use a hey. <laughs> All the other small cards in the suit, and there'll be nine small cards in the suit, two through ten, because the ace has got number one taken care of. All the other small cards of the suit live inside their ace, and so do the court cards. It's all fractals. As the old Buddhist joke says, it's turtles all the way down. And it starts with the court cards. A knight, a queen, a prince, and a princess. Other decks say king, queen, uh, knight, page. Basically, we're dealing with a father, mother, son, and daughter. And in the world of Kabbalah, it's an incestuous family uh, that doesn't even, uh, it's not even illegal. 
They're miniature reflections of yod heh vav He living inside their ace. The nine small cards of each suit also live inside their ace, just like the whole tree of life uh, uh, of every suit. So it's like this. That's the ace. See the ace up on top? And the small cards are the rest of it. Ace of cups. The whole tree of life for an ace of cups. Whole tree of life for the ace of swords. Whole tree of life for the ace of discs. These four letters of the great word are really a big deal. They form the primal pattern for the entire lesser arcana of the tree. Getting back to the court cards just for a moment. The knights, queens, and princes, each of each suit, each represent 30 degrees of the year, from 20 degrees of one sign to 20 degrees of the next. The nine small cards in each suit, the twos through tens, live in groups of three, inside each knight, queen, and prince. Each small card represents one decan, or period of 10 degrees within the 30 degrees the court card rules. Now you might be wondering about the princess. Princess is the earth subdivision of the court cards. So she's special. She's called the throne of the ace. They go together. It's like the alpha and omega of the, of the suit. They don't represent, princesses don't represent degrees of the year. They rule, the aces and princes rule quadrants of space. It's really complex and we won't get into it this evening. And it's almost easier to uh, get out a deck of tarot cards, organize them, and you go, oh, I get it. I mentioned that the 36 small cards live in groups of three inside the, uh, the knight, queen, or princess. But because it's the cosmic duty of the elements to mix with each other, the knights, queens, and princes are asked to adopt the last decan of the previous zodiac sign and donate the last decan of their own to the following sign. It's a deal they made. It's the adopt a decan program. Taken by themselves, the twos, threes, and fours represent all the cardinal signs of the zodiac. The five, six, and sevens represent the fixed signs of the zodiac, and the eights, nines, and tens represent the mutable signs of the zodiac. Now, to make things even better, <laughs> would you ever notice that you've got cards that look like they'd be perfectly good cards? You, oh, the nine of swords. <laughs> Should be good nine, so wonderful. And so, uh, but there's cards that, that abundance, love, Torture, murder, and suicide. Yeah. <laughs> bummer. There's happiness cards. There's bummer cards. <laughs> and everything in between. How do you think that they got those divinatory meanings? Because there is a formula, a Kabbalistic formula, depending on the suit and the number on the tree of life, and their decan of a uh, sign of the zodiac, and the final factor in the equation is this planet that gets assigned to each one of them. Now, coming down the tree of life from Saturn all the way to Luna, it's Saturn, Jupiter, Mars, Sol, uh, Venus, Mercury, Luna. It's in that order. Planets are assigned to the small cards, starting at zero degrees Leo, Cordelion, the 
Chaldean start of the year, start of the astrological year, and they go in that order. Well, just like this, see? Starting right there, there the planets are assigned in that descending tree of life order that repeats and repeats and repeats and repeats. There's it got a little hiccup over here, but we'll talk about that later. Hey, I didn't invent this system. <laughs> and once again, it's easier to understand when you got a deck of cards organized in front of you uh, than it is to even describe it. So. Initiation is the path of waking up. As Masons, we've already willfully placed our foot upon the path of initiation. And by doing so, we've triggered an unstoppable chain of events. Nothing in heaven or earth can now prevent us from arriving inevitably at our destination. Kabbalah teaches us that each of us is the perfect image of God. When we come to full realization of who we are, when we wake up, we'll realize that. At the moment, however, most of us are not awake to our true divine nature. We sleep and we dream that we're in a dream inside a dream inside of many other dreams. I cannot wake you up. Masonry cannot wake you up. Kabbalah cannot wake you up. Death cannot wake you up. Reincarnation cannot wake you up. Only when you open your heart and mind and allow yourself to be the perfect reflection of the great architect of the universe. Only when you start tuning up the sleep, rusted, moving parts of your soul will you begin again to think like God. No one can teach you how to awaken. No matter how long and hard you study, you can't study to awaken. You can only remember how to awaken. The mind-expanding techniques of Kabbalah represent only one among many methods that can trigger this awakening. My Kabbalah is not, or ever will be, your Kabbalah. And you'll proceed in your work in your own unique way. Each of us slumber in our own dream. So each of us must awaken in our own particular way. That's the end of my talk. Thank you, guys. Oh, thank you, guys. Um, I've got tarot cards up here. But I've just got a couple of books and a couple of my CDs on a table up there. Uh, uh, if, if I have to take them home, my wife will say, didn't they love you? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not above that. Uh, but anyway, if you see something that, that you like, uh, there's a little uh, payment thing or a little price thing. Uh, you can PayPal me the money whenever you want or never. <laughs> Don't worry about the demons. <laughs> but anyway, so thank you again, you guys. Well, anyway, the, uh, 
I fully expected to have the third printing of the, the deck here tonight, uh, but it just didn't make it from China or Timbuktu or wherever they're being uh, printed in time. Uh, but they will be available, and all you have to do is Google Tarot of Ceremonial Magic, and you can order them ahead of time. Uh, uh, they have all of the collateral information on each card, the dates they represent, the degrees of the zodiac. They represent the Kabbalistic angels that are assigned to each of the decans, the Goetic spirits uh, that are assigned to each uh, decan, the Enochian uh, uh, squares and, uh, and tablets that each of the cards represents. I mean, how much would you pay for a deck like this? <laughs> Don't answer. There's more. So. Okay, first of all, brilliant. I, I've just been really enjoying everything that you presented here tonight. Oh, and thank you. and uh, to ask, ask anyone to form a, um, an understandable question after you just loaded us with stuff like that. Thank you very much. That's a very oh, sad. <laughs> I mean, no, seriously. Um, but I do have a question about path working. So, about path working? Yeah. Okay. So initiation, uh, I mean, we're in, right? But how do you know? What do you do? What, do you, what, what, is, what is your commentary on path working? Uh, I'm not a big path working Kabbalistic worker, okay? Uh, first of all, the, the names of each of the paths uh, uh, tell me nothing. The classical names for each of the paths. The scintillating intelligence. The furry intelligence. Uh, they don't tell me enough to give me anything to, to hang my, my work on. Uh, I work uh, 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 from Sephira to Sephira, uh, and if you would call that path workings, uh, then I'll do exercises similar to that. Uh, and of course, in the first 25 years of my magical work, I did all sorts of stuff like that. Okay, and I'm not saying that it's not helpful because I would have no idea of my level of awakeness had I not wasted my time. <laughs> Wait, there, nothing is a waste of time, is what I'm saying. Um, so the, uh, the idea of moving from one level of consciousness to another in a systematic uh, way, even if it's a, a pantomime of making that move to sort of set up the structure of your, the trajectory of your awakening. Uh, I found it much more easy to uh, utilize the Enochian system that uh, instead of breaking things up into uh, 10 major wake-ups, uh, the Enochian uh, uh, system has, has 30 levels of consciousness that sort of ease you into it. And they give you a nice, uh, a uh, little song to sing in an angelic language <laughs> that makes you stoned. And in that stonedness uh, for reciting that language, you have a vision when you close your eyes. And that vision speaks to you in the language of your own images, the vocabulary of your own metaphors. They speak to you in vignettes of, of uh, little stories. Rather, no angel has ever appeared to me and said, what you need to do is draw nine pentagram rituals over there. Oh, you should be facing north. Okay. Well, <laughs> they never do that. Okay. They, only, they always, I'll ask a question and they won't answer it like, like you would expect, like on, uh, you know, a Hammer film or Stephen King thing. Uh, they always sort of wave their wing like that, and all of a sudden I'm in a play. I'm in a, I'm in a, a new environment, a new landscape. 
you know, and a bird comes and does something symbolic. I go, oh, God, I get it. Oh, you know. Uh, that's what I resonate to most, uh, most often or easier. Uh, and I've sat through too many guided meditations. Like, close your eyes, put your full consciousness and attention into your navel. We're now calling on the Archangel Raphael to come to come to come. Yes, yes, Raphael. Is ah, we all should be seeing a man in a yellow suit, and now he's eating fish sticks with his toes. And, and with the idea that a guided meditation should be telling you what you should be seeing, when that's not what the heck you're seeing. Okay, you got your own, you got your own universe. You got your own language of of how you speak to yourself, and and uh, I have to really. Uh, well, I'm the laziest magician in the world, so. Uh, it's got to be more right hemisphere for me than, than most ceremonial magicians are happy doing. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. And there's nothing wrong with eating fish sticks with your toes. So. <laughs> I think I have a pretty simple one. It's more of a structural question around your diagrams. I noticed that you're going counterclockwise and right to left in the presentation. And I'm wondering kind of how that relates to how the brain functions um, when you're learning things. I know in Hebrew you're going right to left, but that was, I've always had this thing with the calendar and wheel of the year counterclockwise for me, whereas most it's yeah, let's go. clockwise, so. Let's, let's just. Probably go a bit more <sighs> in depth, but. It's, uh, uh, do you see the order of the zodiac here? Okay, that, that's how you usually see it in astrology things. It, it does go counterclockwise. But, uh, I mean, in space, what's counterclockwise? Stand on your head, it's something else. Uh, but it was uh, just out of convenience, I guess, more than anything else. Uh, this is going counterclockwise, too. Uh, I've got a deck of cards here that I put in uh, order. And I got the 36 small cards. And the way I've got them listed, I spread them out like that clockwise, but then they read counterclockwise. <laughs> it's just to confuse the client. Mm. No. Uh, so uh, as for how the brain functions, uh, I really don't know. I'm not, but, I'm not yeah. qualified to know how the brain functions. Uh, but I do know that when I start working with this stuff and uh, uh, I'm already given a, a whole rich library full of other diagrams that treat the zodiac in a, going counterclockwise, uh, it's just more convenient for me to, uh, to cooperate with that. And then the right to left is just from the Hebrew Oh, the reference. Hebrew. Right. Oh, okay. Because you were giving some other diagrams that were going right to left instead of right, left to right, even in order of the zodiac. It's uh, yeah, just a way some, of working that you've Some of gotten. mine, if I wanted to put the, yeah. uh, the, the tarot cards going fire, water, air, and earth, yeah, it might look like my Hebrew is backwards. Uh, Huh. It'd be going yod yod hey vav hey instead yeah, yeah, of yod hey yeah, vav yeah. hey. So, okay. Yeah. Very simple. And question. please feel free to just ignore all my stuff. <laughs> <laughs> so, Thanks. Okay. Yes. Excellent talk. Uh, so there's. Quite a bit of complexity, uh, as you exemplified in the tarot 
uh, what the meanings between the major and minor arcana are and the relationships between everything. And what I'm wondering is, is did, in, in Tarot's origination, did some highly educated genius sit and say, okay, this is the plan, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to create this thing to represent these things, or was it more of just unconsciously ad hoc through the ages, uh, it developed and kind of fell into, into what it became? How, how, how did it get to where it was at? Uh, much as I love Paul Case's uh, story of the Fez Morocco uh, Hyatt House meeting, uh, and something like that uh, may have uh, may have occurred uh, when the idea of focusing on uh, pictographic uh, cards. Uh, but no, let's get really just real. Uh, tarot cards came from two games. Uh, Taruchi or Taruki or however you pronounce it, which is a game that Bridge uh, developed from. And it had uh, uh, an unspecified number of cards. And it was a game for Northern European uh, rich aristocrats to play because they needed an artist to create as many as 60 cards and paint them and, and uh, adorn them. And the game was a game of a parade, a triumphal parade. That's where the word Trump comes from. It was a triumphal parade, like the Tournament of Roses parade. And each character in the parade, oh, they had uh, gods and goddesses. They had principles like, you know, faith, hope, charity, that kind of thing, temperance, courage. Uh, but they had uh, 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 the, the planetary gods. They had uh, cards that, that easily represented the signs of the zodiac. But they had the, the king the emperor, the empress. They had the joker, the, the harlequin. They had the pope. They had the devil. Okay, they, But they had all sorts of stuff. They had the candlestick maker, and they had the, the hangman, and they've got, they, they had all sorts of cards. But each of those cards, if they were afloat in a parade, had their position in the parade. They had a hierarchical position in a parade. So when then you passed out the cards to your aristocratic friends, you'd shuffle them and pass it out. And you'd put one card down, and your, your uh, opponent would put a card that trumped it, that was ahead of it in the triumphal parade. And that, then you won that, won that hand. OK. Now it gets really, truly magical. More magical than if there was a uh, meeting at the Fe uh, Hyatt House in Fez, Morocco. When these cards stop being the game reserved just for the elite, when a simple three-color printing process was developed in Northern Europe, these cards could be mass produced or more popularly available. And it was so cool. It was like the television of the day. And cultural human consciousness got a hold of these cards and were fascinated. It was like watching television as you traveled. It was fun, okay, and you played the game. And when human consciousness gets a hold of something, we're all hardwired the same way. We're all hardwired with 3, 7, and 12 because that's the dimension we live in. And when a human consciousness en masse gets a hold of something, it like, uh, it's like the sheet of paper 
upon which are iron filings that sit on a magnet. When human consciousness gets a hold of something, it starts to shake that paper so that the iron filings fall away from everything except the magnetic lines of force. And when human consciousness got a hold of the uh, Teruchi, it shook away the baker and the candlestick maker. They got lost and people didn't miss them. It shook it a little more and it got rid of, of uh, the superfluous ones until it came up with three primitive elements, seven planetary uh, cards and 12 zodiac cards. And it stuck at 22. And that just happens to be how human consciousness got a hold of the Hebrew alphabet, too. Now, that's more magical than a convention at the Fez Morocco Hyatt House. The next card, the next part, the Lesser Arcana, came from a, uh, a game called Mamluk. And Mamluk, a deck of Mamluk cards is just like the cards you can go down to the liquor store and buy today. A deck of playing cards. Four suits, okay, uh, 10 pips each, and three court cards. Gypsies, and here the gypsy connection is pretty pretty established. Gypsies would divine with anything. They were really good at it. They had a Mamluk deck. They had a Teruchi deck that was now 22, because it had turned by now into the Terror of Marseille. And they started to mix them up together. They probably looked different, even. But unlike the Teruchi shaking, somehow human consciousness rebelled at only three court cards. We're hardwired to resonate to a father, a mother, a son, and a daughter. So somewhere along the line, the Mamluk deck picked up four additional court cards. And then when the Kabbalists started getting a hold of this stuff, like late 1600s, they said, wow, man, it's structured just exactly like the fractaling of, of, the, of the Kabbalah and the, the Hebrew alphabet. Okay? But human consciousness is the magician here and not any, any particular genius. A genius might have recognized what they had once they had it, but the formation of it is far more of a wonder story. It, it either happened like that or it didn't. <laughs> so, so. How you doing? Oh, fine. Yes, you seem very fine. Uh, how do you, can you explain more about how you see the octahedron inside the cube in relationship to the Hebrew letters and sounds and colors all vibrating to each other and how they, is that your concept or our concept of up and down simultaneous? Kinda. Uh. Well, as chaotically as you described it, is about how I see it. Uh, well, the, uh, if you look at things uh, like you 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 break light up uh, with a, with a prism, it goes into seven very primary or uh, seven very distinct colors. Uh, when you sit down to a piano, you've only got an octave to work with. Uh, 
you could see it reflected in thirds and and uh, uh, with flats and everything. You got your twelve. It's reflected in absolutely everything, absolutely everything. And you further break things up. You can see why why Mathers uh, went to great length and, and Moynier was a uh, was an artist. And the colors, as they're described in Golden Dawn material, are uh, what's the name of the watercolor company? It's still in existence in London. Crowley probably still owes them money. <laughs> uh, but they are the way they are because of a very logical mix of uh, mix of those colors and things. Uh, but ultimately, there's only one note. And it's like at each step of the waking, uh, waking up, the things become more harmonious and simple, more harmonious and simple, until the, until the, the, the beauty itself is just a, a beautiful uh, singularity in which you hear all the music and see all the colors and the uh, uh, the, our interest in studying about the, 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 the breakup of all of these, uh, uh, of all of these things, in a way, is to just finally get us to the point of where we are so tired of seeing the fractal beauty of everything that we just step out of our ruach and plop down in the beautiful jello of our neshama. And it's, uh, you know, I say, you know, Kabbalah is made, is, uh, it's made for you to have a nervous breakdown in a very socially acceptable way. <laughs> that, that's pretty much, uh, that's pretty much uh, what it is. And I'm so glad that wonderful artists uh, in their awakening process, you know, give us such beautiful uh, uh, diagrams and artwork and, and things like that just to make it so easily accessible to us. Thank you. Uh oh. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for a great talk, as always, Lon, and your wisdom and humor. Um, in addition to the books out front, which we did mean to mention, by the way, there's only one or two left. Uh, they're actually right outside the door here. There's also that wonderful scrapbook you left of when you actually created the deck. Speaking of great artists and watercolors and Constance who colored it, so people should definitely check that out. But what I wanted to ask in addition to that was, what is a good question to ask of a tarot reading or uh, of a tarot reader? or the manner in which the question should be constructed, or what, what's an appropriate question or how to frame it? And as they say, I'll take your answer off the air. <laughs> <laughs> OK. Um, well, I, I read Tara over the phone a lot. OK, it's uh, uh, part of how I make a living. And uh, a great deal of my time with, with the client is at the very beginning, where I see what the hell they really want to know, okay? Because they'll come at me with all sorts of things. I want to know this, 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 this. Should I? And uh, should I do this, or is you that? And uh, and they're all good questions, and they're 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 serious about it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be coming to a like a counselor. But a bad question to ask is, should you do anything? And I know that's the way you'd like to hear the answer. Should I take that new job? Shall I dump her? Is she going to dump me? You know, uh, Avoid yes or no things, first of all, because a yes is just as obscure as a no in a, in a tarot answer. Um, so don't uh, ask a should you do anything. Uh, yes, you should, because then you'll uh, be hit by a truck 
and the truck and the truck driver will be sent to prison, but he won't have the baby that would have grown up to be Hitler and destroyed the world. Yes, you should. Get hit by a truck, save the world. But the best thing to ask, and uh, you can hardly talk anybody into doing it, is what do you need to know right now in a way that you can actually understand it? Don't give me a riddle. Give me an answer in an image that I can understand. And in, in order to get to that point, they really have to know what the question is. And it will be very specific at first. And you, if you ask, well, why do you want the new job? Then you find out why they want the new job. And it has much more to do with happiness than it does whatever they're going to do with this new job. And you can say, why do you even want to be happy like that? <laughs> OK. I took acting lessons at uh, Lee Strasberg uh, uh, Film and Theater Institute in LA when I was a kid. and. Uh, Strasburg would get some a volunteer and deconstruct them right in front of everybody. They volunteered in a very loving, grandfatherly, avuncular way. But he would get right down to what made them tick. And he would jump on that button for about five minutes and then he'd feed them a line of something that they already had memorized. And they'd be confused in their, in their sobbing and their tears. They'd be confused. And he said, no, no. And he'd give them, give them the line. And then they'd deliver the thing right from that spot. Yeah. And that spot is really what you want to be in when you ask a tarot, tarot question. You really want to know what that is. Because when you're at that spot, any observable phenomena <laughs> any observable phenomena will tell you your answer. Because your answer is screaming at you from all directions. When you get to that point, the ketchup bottle label is going to tell you your answer. <laughs> and it doesn't matter if you're throwing bones or runes or dice. You're going to look at those and go, I get it. OK, so it's easier to see the truth in something that's perfect. The Yi Ching is perfect. The Yi Ching is as perfect as the Kabbalah. The Yi Ching is the Chinese Kabbalah. But it's based on eights. That's OK. Every number is infinite. Beauty is perfect. You could ask your question while taking a walk in a beautiful environment. Or you've heard of walking your question off? I went to the beach and I came back and I knew, uh, by God, I'm going to do that. I'm going to set myself on fire in front of the UN. <laughs> <laughs> Mathematics is beautiful. And that's why the, not to me, but that's why, that's why tarot and Kabbalah. It's easier to see the answer in something that's perfect. But it's possible to see it in absolutely everything, because ultimately everything is perfect in its own way. Just a couple quick announcements. OK. OK, first of all, thank you, Mom. I just have to say that uh, of all the presentations I've seen you do, I've never seen uh, 
something repeat. I always see new information. I think uh, we're just really fortunate to have Juan Malaquet here in Southern California, uh, so close by. He lectures all over the world and flies all around, and uh, we're just fortunate to be able to see as much as, as, of him as we can. And I strongly suggest uh, you guys buy books that are outside or go on Amazon or Barnes and Noble and buy some of them. They've been extremely influential in my life. Um, I don't tell too many people, but Lon was actually really influential in me uh, joining Freemasonry, actually. I don't, I don't know if I would have joined Freemasonry if it wasn't for the example of Lon Mallory Duquette. And, uh, and seeing that he's been a Mason for 25 years. I think he's been doing this in the esoteric tradition for 45 years. So that was very impactful for me. And, uh, Thank you so much. Oh, you're welcome. And uh, also, just want to remind everybody, so we do have dessert outside. It's going to be, so we also have, hang on, there's something else on the menu. Salmon. There's smoked salmon. <laughs> That's and then there's going to be, there's smoked salmon with uh, dill on cucumbers. <gasps> and then there's going to be Nutella cheesecake, mango rice pudding in lime syrup, brownies, lavender shortbread with lemon curd. So Whoa! Say, uh, so an appetite, there might be more wine as well. Also, want to remind everybody uh, we'll have another lecture the second Tuesday of October. Um, a brother Theo will be presenting on I think he's calling it the uh, ontological implications of Masonic thought. Also, want to acknowledge um, our past master, worshipful Michael Wombach, on the controls here. He got here early. There's been an tireless effort in this law. <laughs> With that, also, um, Preston actually put this together today. We didn't have a uh, screen up, so we actually built this today. So thanks, everybody, for the, the teamwork, and thanks, everybody, for showing up. And uh, we'll toast outside to liberty, equality, and fraternity. Hit yeah! Hit.